Hello everybody, my topic is nonlinear time, a concept which we encounter very frequently in science fiction and speculative fiction, and its philosophical implications, mostly that of determinism. In order to speak about this, we need to talk about how we as human beings think. It's, uh, this is a very, very deep subject, and I only mean it in a very basic way, as in how we experience the world in a <laughs> what I mean when I say how we think is that human beings tend to understand and experience the world around them in a sequential, causal way. As in, event A leads to event B, and event B... Çok sesi geliyordur, değil mi bunun? Narratives we tell, both in the... Certain examples in other genres, we can... Durdurup baştan mı devam edeyim? Devam edebiliriz. For the most part, we understand the world and time as being sequential and we form causal relationships between different things. Meaning that event A leads to event B or event C happens because event B happened. So we mostly form cause and effect relationships between different things that happen and we can see the implications of this in all of our sciences and almost all of the narratives we tell both in our own lives and in the media. Sorry for the interruption, but we love our construction here in Turkey. So, uh, as I was saying, in science fiction and speculative fiction and in certain examples of other genres, we can encounter the idea and the concept of nonlinear time, which is to explain in Vonnegut's words, all moments, past, present and future, always have existed and always will exist, he says. Meaning that in the conception of nonlinear time, events don't happen sequentially one after the other, but they all happen at the same time or they happen out of sequence. And we only experience them in a certain order right now, which is actually an idea that some fringe physicians and scientists have adopted but that there isn't actually any linearness or any order to time in fact that there is no time and that everything already has happened at the same time and that we're just retroactively experiencing them this way now this idea of non-linear time is very prominent in slaughterhouse five the perhaps the most famous work of kurt vonnegut and in this novel, he uses this idea not as a focal point of the story or even as a real science fiction concept, but just as a narrative tool to tell his story and to transmit his anti-war message. Now, in Slaughterhouse-Five, the protagonist, Billy Pilgrim, gets kidnapped by, uh, by the Tralfamadorians, an alien race who wholly experience time in a non-linear fashion, but even before he gets abducted by aliens, Billy Pilgrim, in the words of Vonnegut, becomes unstuck in time. Becoming unstuck in time is what Vonnegut calls the non-linear conception of time that Billy starts to experience. And he very simply explains this by saying, Billy Pilgrim has come unstuck in time. Billy has gone to, has gone to sleep a senile widower and awakened on his wedding day. He has walked through a door in 1955 and come out another one in 1941. He has gone back through that door to find himself in 1963. He has seen his birth and death many times, he says, and pays random visits to all, these, all the events in between. 
Billy is spastic in time, has no control over where he's going next, and the trips aren't necessarily fun. He's in a constant state of stage fright, he says, because he never knows what part of his life he's going to have to act in next. And this, along with another passage in which uh, Vonnegut explains the philosophy of the Tralfamadorians regarding death, which I will read in, in a short while, uh, is the only explanation Vonnegut really gives as to what this idea is, as to what nonlinear time is. But even though he doesn't really delve into the scientific explanations or implications of this concept, uh, Vonnegut explores the philosophical implications of nonlinear time very, very deeply, mostly through the philosophy of the Tralfamadorians juxtaposed over Billy's uh, philos philosophy and worldview. Now, we see this perhaps most potently in a conversation between Billy and a Tralfamadorian, where the Tralfamadorian says, All time is all time. It does not change. It does not lend itself to warning or explanation. It simply is. Take it moment by moment, and you will find that we are all, as I've said before, bugs in amber. You sound to me as though you don't believe in free will, says Billy Pilgrim. If I hadn't spent so much time studying Earthlings, said the Tralfamadorian, I wouldn't have any idea what was meant by free will. I've visited 31 inhabited planets in the universe, and I have studied reports on 100 more. Only on Earth is there any talk of free will. So, from this passage we can understand that Vonnegut thinks that the idea of nonlinear time very simply, completely removes the concept of free will. And while there is certainly a very determinist implication to nonlinear time, in his story, uh, The Story of Your Life, Te Cheng has a different perspective on free will, and we'll be talking about that more later, but some but accompanying Vonnegut's determinism in Slaughterhouse-Five is an idea of acceptance. And even though Vonnegut is most definitely not the fetus in the novel, we can very strongly see that the Tralfamadorians are very accepting of the most horrible, most awful events in life and in the history of the universe, to be quite frank. For example, speaking about death, Billy Pilgrim, speaking about his time with the Tralfamadorians, says The most important thing I learned on Tralfamador was that when a person dies, he only appears to die. He is still very much alive in the past, so it is very silly for people to cry at his funeral. All moments, past, present and future, always have existed, always will exist. The Tralfamadorians can look at all the different moments just the way we can look at the stretch of look at a stretch of the Rocky Mountains, for instance. They can see how permanent all the moments are, and they can look at any moment that interests them. It is just an illusion we have here on Earth that one moment follows another one, like beads on a string, and that once a moment is gone, it is gone forever. And whenever a person dies on Tralfamador, the only thing that is said after him, in, in place of eulogies, or in place of crying after the person who has departed, they only say, so it goes, which is actually how Vonnegut ends his novel. And when Billy Pilgrim asked the Tralfamadorians what they think about the horrific nature of Earthlings and how Earth is a planet torn by wars and atrocities like the Dresden firebombing, which Pilgrim witnesses during his time as a soldier in World War II, the Tralfamadorians say that... They know how the universe ends, and that it has nothing at all to do with Earth. That the universe actually ends as a result of a botched science experiment by a Tralfamadorian. And well, to explain this, they say, in response to Billy's question of how does the universe end, we blow it up, experimenting with new fuels for our flying saucers. A Tralfamadorian test, pi test pilot presses a starter button, and the whole universe disappears, so it goes. If you know this, said Billy, isn't there some way you can prevent it? Can't you keep the pilot from pressing the button? He has always pressed it, and he always will. We always let him, and we always will let him. The moment is structured that way. So, said Billy gropingly, I suppose that the idea of preventing war on Earth is stupid, too. Of course, says the Tralfamadorians, and here we can see just how determinist and just how accepting the Tralfamadorian worldview is, and also, in a way, Vonnegut's worldview. And, 
And although this seems quite defeatist, it's more an idea of being at peace with the world and at peace with what happens. Because, of course, when you remove cause and consequence from the equation, there isn't really much you can do to change anything. You just have to experience life looking at the good moments or the bad moments. In The Story of Your Life, a short story by Te Chiang, which was the basis for the recent science fiction movie Arrival, the author explores the concept of nonlinear time in a much more focalized, much more science fiction-like way than Vonnegut does, because truly, nonlinear time is the focal point of the story. And interestingly, he not only explores the physics of this, or the mathematics of non-linear time and the implication that this concept has for the different scientific disciplines but he also speaks a lot and he also writes about linguistics uh, first of all of course the way the concept of non-linear time is introduced to us is through the main character of the story who starts by learning the language of the heptapods the alien race who have arrived on earth and here in a interesting turn by learning this language he starts experiencing time the way the heptapods do in a non-linear fashion and this of course is actually an incorporation of suffer dwarfism a theory that says that our mother language and also any other language that we learn well enough can influence the way that we think and the way that we experience the world around us now on the subject of linguistics the heptapods don't write in sentences or with words the way we do, but with what they first call in the story logograms and then semograms, which are, unlike in the movie where they're circles, in the story they're more like a squiggly line. But still, in the story as well as in the movie, the heptapods don't write the way we do, starting at one point and ending at the other. Their writing process, which both in the movie and in the story we don't see happening manually but on screens is simultaneous they write the beginning of the sentence and the middle of the sentence and the end of the sentence more or less at the same time and this of course is a very different way at looking at writing because as it mentions in the story in order to be able to fill in the blanks between the end of the sentence and the beginning of a sentence especially one that's like a single flowing line we have to know exactly where it will end and exactly where it will begin which means that we have to be able to know the exact length of the line and the exact space will, that will be required to write the sentence down and so it's necessary to be able to foretell the exact length of the logogram and so writing in he the heptapod language is something that also requires a non-linear conception of time and through learning to write in this language the main character louise learns to experience time in this way now in his exploration of determinism and free will through the concept of non-linear time chiang mentions what he calls a borgesian fabulation the book of the the book of ages the book of ages is a huge tome which of course is not even imaginable to have a physical form because of its vastness that has written in it every single thing that has happened and that will ever happen in the universe to anybody and everybody and everything here he poses the question of what happens if a person can read the book of a the book of ages for example, he speaks of a woman who finds this book and manages to find her own portion of the book and using a, using a magnifier she reads that the day after she finds this book of ages she uses the information in it to put down a hundred dollars on a horse race and then win ten times as much as a result. And here Chang poses the questions, what do you do if you find the book of ages? Because I mean, logically, it's not even possible for such a book to exist, of course, because the idea of non-linear time and the idea of being able to force your own future is something that does not at all fit into our concept, in that does not at all fit into our conventional understanding of logic or of how the, wor the world works. 
because the idea of consequence, the idea of causality is so deeply ingrained into our understanding of the world that our entire logic system is built around it. But in its own internal logic, the book of, the book of Ages, as Chiang writes, cannot be wrong. This scenario is based on the premise that a person is given the knowledge of the actual future, not of some possible future. And he then questions whether or not this person would, as written in the Book of Ages, actually bet that money on the race and actually win back the amount of money that is foretold in the book. And says that if this were a Greek myth, then there would be some convoluted plot of the fates to make the person actually act in the way that is foretold in the Book of Ages. But in reality, he says, th there's a contradiction. The Book of Ages must be right by definition, yet no matter what the book says she'll do, she can choose to do otherwise. How can these two facts be reconciled? In other words, how can the idea of a book which has every event in the world written in it, where every event has happened already, in other words, any kind of medium that has the concept of non-linear time, any way that we humans can see the world in a non-linear fashion, coexist with the idea of free will, of choice. And, of course, he says, the common answer is that these two facts cannot be reconciled. Of course, the Book of Ages, as I said, is a logical impossibility, but it might be possible to explain the existence of the Book of Ages by saying that it does exist, that it's just somewhere where nobody can access it that we still live our lives in a determinist way, that everything is already foretold by us, but we don't know that it exists. And this is clearly a very determinist idea, and yet the protagonist says that it isn't actually as determinist or as pre... No, it isn't as determinist or as exclusively mutual with the idea of free choice as it is. Just because something has been foretold does not mean that us doing that something is void of free choice. Determinism does not necessarily exclude free choice because even if something is predetermined, it doesn't mean that it's outside of the realm of our choice. The protagonist of the story says the existence of free will meant that we would meant that we couldn't know the future, and we know free will existed because we had direct experience of it. Volition was an intrinsic part of consciousness. Or was it? What if the experience of knowing the future changed a person? What if it evoked a sense of urgency, a sense of obligation to act precisely as she, know, as she knew she would? In explaining her view on free will, the protagonist of the story says, The heptapods are neither free nor bound as we understand those concepts. They don't act according to their will, nor are they helpless automatons. What distinguishes the heptapod's mode of awareness is not just that their actions coincide with history's events, it is also that their motives coincide with history's purpose. They act to create the future, to enact chronology. So, they act in a teleological way, so that their actions coincide with the finality of the universe. Freedom isn't illusion, it's perfectly real in the con context of consequent consciousness. Within the context of simultaneous consciousness, freedom is not meaningful, but neither is coer coercion. It's simply a different context, no more or less valid than the other. It's like that famous optical illusion, the drawing of either an elegant young woman, face turned away from the viewer, or a wart-nosed wart crone, chin tucked down on her chest. There is no correct interpretation, both are equally valid, but you can't see both at the same time. Similarly, knowledge of the future was incompatible with free will. What made it possible for me to exercise freedom of choice also made it impossible for me to know the future. Conversely, now that I know the future, I would never act contrary to that future, including telling others what I know. Those who know, what, those who know the future don't talk about it. Those who've read the Book of Ages never admit to it. And this, of course, calls into question, like, if you know what's going to happen, if things have already happened, and if we're re-experiencing them the way the protagonist in the story does, then what's the point of it all? And again, in a, in a portion of the story that touches again upon linguistics and sociolinguistics more so than pure linguistics, Chiang says that 
a large part of language is performative. For example, at a wedding, everybody knows what will happen. But until the person marrying the two people says, thou are now, uh, I now pronounce you husband and wife, then the act has no meaning. It's saying those words. It's the performance, the performative aspect of language that gives the events meaning. And like this, uh, Louise, the protagonist, says, that all of her interactions after becoming aware of the heptapod's conception of time, after experiencing time the way the heptapods do, have a very performative side to them. It's like she's acting out the scripts that she already knows is happening, like she's performing in a play, but she does them anyway because to speak and to act is to make things become real. It's not... Uh, it's not improvised action, but it's the realization. It's performing something to realize a plan, to make something happen in on itself, even if we know that it happens, even if we know the consequence. Uh, honestly, at this point, we've kind of beat the determinism aspect of nonlinear time into the ground. But uh, another philosophical implication of this idea, of this concept, that is very interesting is that of teleology, which is in a very, very basic sense, the idea of goal-orientedness, perhaps. And in the story of your life, Chiang explains this through the Fermat principle, which is the idea that when faced with water, light breaks at a certain point and always moves in a way that will either minimize or maximize its route, meaning that it either acts in a way that will take the longest time or the shortest time to reach where it is. And there are actually two interpretations of this uh, theorem. The first one being that light breaks because it hits the surface of the water and that this is a causal, causal relationship between light refracting when faced with a body of water. And the other explanation, the teleological interpretation of this, is that, as I've said, light has a finality that it wants to reach. It wants to go from point A to point B, and to do this, it will always follow either the longest or the shortest route available to it. In explaining Fermat's principle and how it, what it means for teleology, they, well, Gary, the physician in the story, says that in relation to this, idea, you're used to thinking of refraction in terms of cause and effect. Reaching the water's surface is the cause, and the change in direction is the effect. But Fermat's principle sounds weird, because it describes light's behavior in goal-oriented terms. It sounds like a commandment to a light beam. Thou shalt minimize or maximize the time taken to reach thy destination. However, the notion of, the fa of a fastest path is meaningless unless there's a destination specified. And computing how long a given path takes also requires information about what lies along that path, like where the water surfaces. And the light ray has to know all that ahead of time before it starts moving. Because light, in order to maximize or minimize this path, just can't start moving in any given way, or without knowing the obstacles in, it, in its path or what it will encounter, and so, in order to act in this way, in order to act in a teleological fashion to minimize or maximize its path, the light beam has to already have knowledge of what it will encounter. So it will have to know for a fact that when it starts moving from point A and going to point B, in the middle somewhere here it will encounter the surface of water or some other thing. And this also means that in order to have a teleological interpretation or a teleological explanation of Fermat's principle, that we have to, again, suppose a non-linear or a deterministic uh, progression of events, that we have to have some foreknowledge of what will happen, that the light has to have this foreknowledge of what will happen. And this idea of the teleological interpreta interpretation of Fermat's principle shows us, for one, that even though we explain everything in our world through science in a very causal way, because this is the way that we've been taught to think that this is the way that we experience the world, which is, of course, very, very natural, because science, after all, is a functional thing. It's not meant to 
to philosophize about the universe or about our place in it, but it's meant to explain things. And the easiest way for us to explain things is through causal relations, because we do, after all, experience the world in a linear and causal way. This different interpretation, which has actually been discussed since, I think, the 1600s in the philosophy of science, shows us that even though there are there is one possible interpretation of the world and of science, a causal one, it's also possible to interpret our scientific findings and the world around us, even the very concrete, very clear-cut things, it's also possible to interpret these things in a different way, through a different lens and through a different way of thinking and of being. And this is also something that we see in the other fields of science in this story, as the, the heptapods have very... Ha they have a lot of difficulty understanding the concepts that we see as very basic in the world. But, like in math, they have a very good, very solid understanding of, for example, integral calculus, which for us is very advanced, very extreme, very difficult to understand concepts, but for them are just the fundamentals of their science. They're the very basic things for which are for example, for us, addition or subtraction. And once again, we can see the author touching on the interpretive side of the conundrum that nonlinear time poses, and how even though we now, in our own reality, experience time as being linear and have forged all of our sciences and all of our knowledge and all of our narratives around this, it's quite possible that this is only our experience and that time isn't actually linear and that there is actually no causality in the universe. That this might all just be an interpretation. In the passage, humans had developed a sequential mode of awareness, while heptapods had developed a simultaneous mode of awareness. We experienced events in an order and perceived their relationship as cause and effect. They experienced all events at once and perceive a purpose underlying them all, a minimizing, maximizing purpose. And here, with the heptapods acting to realize this purpose, to realize this their role in the finality of time and in the finality of universe, of the universe, in a perhaps yes, a very deterministic fashion. This is also the aspect of this idea that actually removes the defeatism of it, and which shows us that perhaps the idea of free will isn't necessary for our existence or for our philosophy, because all things, according to teleologi teleological explanations and interpretations and philosophy, all things have a finality, we all have a purpose, and everything we do in this world, being how small or how large they are, our actions, our performances, meant to realize this purpose, to bring us closer to this objective. Thank you for listening to this convoluted and <laughs> messy presentation, and I hope you've enjoyed it all.